I'm going to go to the uh, uh, to the another group because this group just shoots me down time after time after I express myself. Okay. All right. Great having you here this morning on this. Be- how you liking this kind of nice, brisk, cool weather? That is great to have out there for in the middle of the summer. And the Lord good to provide that for us. You know, I want to tell you, Phil, are you leaving the uh, <laughs> leaving the building? I mean, I, knew, I didn't mean to offend you or anything, but I must mean I, my cue for singing a little bit more. How many want to be? No. Uh, I want to say how much I enjoy getting to know you guys. I really do. I enjoy. We have such a broad gamut of folks here. I mean, we have young, old. We have all kinds of people from all over and everything. Are you guys talking while I'm talking over there? <laughs> Charles Waterloo is a, but he was trouble in school. Listen, I just want to tell you um, how much I enjoyed being with you guys. And uh, one of the things I like about it is uh, the breadth of people we have. And so what I thought I'd do is just occasionally, you know, I've done it by my little, I've done it here without you coming up. But I want to occasionally introduce a couple of you. And I'm I, I, uh, two of the guys that I thought I would introduce today. That I, and I will never do this unless I ask you. So don't, don't. Uh, I used to tell people when uh, classes that I lead, I'd never call on you to pray unless I ask you. I just feel like that's out of respect. Um, I wanted, uh, Jason, you come up here, and Ray. I want to introduce Jason and Ray to you, and uh, I'm not, they're not going to tell their story. We don't have time for all that. I just want to occasionally, because I enjoy the breadth of uh, people we have here, I want to uh, introduce to you the, the breadth of folks we have here, and uh, I've enjoyed both times, uh, 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 all the times getting to know these guys. Uh, Jason, tell them just tell them your name, what's maybe what you do, maybe how you came to the round table real quick. Uh, my name is Jason Brown from Houston, Texas. Came here through uh, Bellhaven University, uh, working at Black Summit Financial Group currently. Uh, I'd like to stay there if that's okay. And uh, I came to the round table. I see Phil. Uh, he invited me, and I know some other great guys here, Van and, and uh, Robert. So that's how I got plugged in. And he's 21 years old. And... Uh, Married, right? And just a delightful guy. Came to play baseball for Bellhaven. Stayed here and will continue to stay here, we hope. Right, Jason? Good. <laughs> Me, John Norton. John Norton. John Norton. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> And then to the right of me here is Ray. Ray, tell them a little about you and what you do there quickly. Yes, thank you for uh, letting me come here. I, I love this round table. I'm, I'm, and again, my name is Ray Clark. I come here from Arizona Teen Challenge, and I'm now part of the, the Women's Teen Challenge. It's a program that's uh, here that saves lives. It's a 13-month program. We have centers in uh, Mississippi, Missouri, Tennessee, and Arkansas. And uh, I just love being here, and uh, I can't tell you enough about how, what it means to be a part of a, a program where you can come and really be uh, blessed by what Phil has to say every, every week. And Ray uh, said that he wants to tell his story sometime. He's got a delightful story of coming to the Lord, and um, so we're going to let him do that sometime. Well, thank you. Let's give a round of applause for Ray and Jason. All right, well, uh, again, thanks for being here. Let me just open with prayer, and I'm going to pass the baton over to my brother Phil here. And, uh, uh, again, we just can't thank you enough for carving time out of your busy schedules to come and, and join us here. And uh, we hope that you get a blessing and that it's uh, a beneficial time for you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just come to you in the name of our great Savior, a powerful name, Lord. And we uh, thank you that uh, our Savior is not anemic or dormant or passive but that he's working and he is, uh, he is mightily moving. And, Lord, we call upon his strength this day. Uh, we all, and as we've said, the breadth of people here with various and sundry uh, struggles and, and uh, different degrees of brokenness and pain and uh, even joys and, and um, things of victory, Lord. But, yeah, we come and just uh, ask you to, to meet with us. We want to... We want to be uh, the men of God you want us to be. We don't want to waste the one life we have and all of its brevity. We want to uh, submit ourselves to you. We humbly uh, come under your teaching. Uh, we, Lord, are, are not self-made men. We are men that are made by you and formed by you and get our breath by you. 
and are led by you. And so we just, uh, uh, we just uh, rest in you. We, uh, we, we humbly uh, acquiesce to whatever you have for us and want to be used in our spheres of influence, even this day, Lord. We pray that you would help us not just to survive, but to thrive. And now, Lord, we pray that you would not just inform us, but by your Holy Spirit, transform us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Gentlemen, our series is Stand By Your Man. I want to play a song for you um, that is part of this idea of what you would like her to do. Uh, The title of the song is Stand By Me uh, by Ben E. King. Video from uh, the one of my favorite movies, Stand By Me. But I want you to listen to the words and understand that if you want her to stand by you, when you need to be the man. Has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we'll see. No, I won't. Just as long as you stand, then by me. So darling, darling, stand by me. Oh, stand by me. Oh, stand. Stand by me. Stand by me. If the sky that we look upon should tumble and fall, or the mountain should crumble to the sea. I won't cry, I won't cry, no, I won't shed a tear just as long as you stand, stand by me. on the alert, stand firm in your faith, act like men, be strong. The words from 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Gentlemen, this morning we continue our series on Stand By Me. The whole point of this series is for you to be alerted to what it really means to be a man in the presence of a woman, in the presence of your wife. And if you want her to stand by you, then you need to be more aware of what it really means to be a man. A man after God's own heart, a man who follows God, a man uh, who is submitted to the authority and the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the kind of man that we are inviting you to be and that I want to be. I want you to pick up your pen this morning and engage with me, and I want to ask you a couple questions that you can begin to consider as we spend this time together. And someone once uh, asked me, said, Now, Phil, this Thursday morning thing that you do, is it, a, uh, is it a coaching group, a counseling group, or a Bible study? Yes, is the answer to that question. Uh, first question that I want to ask you to engage in is this. Would you your wife say, quote, my husband really cares about me. Would your wife, and if you're single, then just a special friend, male or female, would somebody accuse you of being caring? Now, the follow-up question to that is this. How do you express care to your wife? In your mind, I'm sure that you believe that you care. How 
do you express care? How do you want her to see or know that you care? What is it that you are doing? How is it that you are seeing her that you want her to interpret that as care? Write it down. And if you can't come up with anything, I have business cards on the back table. Be glad to see you. See, the title of today's session is Every Man Cares. And I believe that to be true. Every man cares. But the question is this. Do you care more about yourself than anybody else? That's a problem. Now, in this series, we've been looking at Genesis 2.24 as our theme passage. And in that passage, of course, is three critical terms that we could spend the whole year uh, teasing out the principles that are under these three words that are in Genesis 2.24, uh, leaving, leaving, leaving. And this morning, again, we're just going to look at a piece of the idea of cleaving. And in this idea of cleaving, comes the principle of care. How do you care? How do you express care? How do you want her to see that you care? Turn over to uh, the Song of Solomon with me. Song of Solomon, I always, every time I read this, I just wish there were pictures. No way. Song of Solomon. Here's the question that I ask as we read this passage. Would your wife say this about you? Listen as I read. The woman, kiss me full on the mouth. Yes, for your love is better than wine. Headier than your aromatic oils. The syllables of your name murmur like a meadow brook. No wonder everyone loves to say your name. Okay, enough about me talking about me. So what do you think about me? Is what the narcissist says. I just love to hear my name. That's it. Take me away with you. Let's run off together, an elopement with my king lover. We'll celebrate, we'll sing, we'll make great music. Yes, for your love is better than vintage wine. Everyone loves you, of course, and why not? Wow. I wish I would hear that every morning. I kind of do in my own head, but that... But, but that doesn't count, you know. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> no, that's it's not the way it's supposed to work. Of that in your own head, who would say that about you, guys? This morning, I want to invite you to take the minute, the few minutes that we have together, to truly consider how well you know yourself as a caring man. And what I want you to consider, first of all, as we start, is just how much do you know yourself, period. Because the gift of being present is the beginning step of caring for another person. When you are with a friend, when you are with your wife, does she really feel like you're present? You know, again, what I would suggest to you is 
the first step of really caring is pay attention to yourself. Where are you, really? I mean, when you are with your wife, where are you? Are you really with her? Are you just kind of trying to fit her in to all the crazy stuff going on in your head? Um, Put the clicker down. Uh, Engage. Look her in the eyes. Paying attention is critical to connecting with another person. It puts you in the now. And yet you might even ask, but but if I'm always paying attention to myself, isn't that a form of narcissism? It's a fair question. You might even ask, but 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 are, are you being drawn into yourself and always away from others if you're just paying attention to yourself? What's interesting is this, is that the research shows that when you are truly present while in the midst of a conversation with someone, that you're actually less narcissistic because you're not preoccupied with yourself. You are aware of how the person is affecting you and what your experience of that person is. You may not realize it, but every time you walk into somebody's presence, they feel something from you. When you walk home at night, there's an energy that comes into the house relative to you. I would like to think when you walk into my presence that you feel welcomed. One of the gifts that God's given me that I just I can't take credit for, it's just a gift. I'm a curious person. I've always been curious. I just I love to learn. I was a reader when I was in the second grade, I mean, when I walked into that, I, I still remember, I mean, this this is crazy. I remember the first time that they marched us down the hall and they took us into the library as a little kid and showed us the library. I was like a drunk guy being taken into the bar. And I was, I was like, wow, you mean we can read all this? And I, I still have on my shelf the biographies in this little set that had the, that had uh, just a couple of pictures in each book of silhouettes, and it was like Davy Crockett, George Washington, and I and I read all of them like in the third grade. I mean, it opened up the world to me. But it's like knowing who you are, being present while in the conversation relationship with another person is the beginning of really caring. It actually, when you pay attention to yourself and you know what's going on inside of you, it really increases your ability to be an empathic to another person. You are most open to another when you're also open to your own self. Now let me say this also. Um, there was a season of my life that I was so chaotic on the inside that I might look like that I was looking at you when I was talking to you, but I was like a million miles away. My anxiety was high. I felt depressed. I was chaotic. In fact, friends of ours, after we moved to Mississippi, we went back to Philadelphia uh, to visit friends, and Mary Jo Jefferson uh, said to Carla, she said, you know, it's so good to talk to Phil because, you know, for so long, it was like when I would talk to Phil, it was like nobody was home. Well, I like you too, Mary Jo. (laughs) You know? But if Mary Jo is listening today from the banks of uh, North Carolina, uh, we love Stephen Mary Jo Jefferson. She was right on the money. I mean, I, I was like, you know, the light was on, kind of, but nobody was home. 
And I would like to think I'm better, certainly not cured, but I'm better at being present. I would like to think that when you talk to me, that you feel like that you're really connecting with somebody who is present and who cares. That's the way I want you to be with your wife. Because the first step in caring is really knowing who you are. But so often I sit with men every day who are upset with their wives and they talk about their wives being this or that in a negative way. And I'm sitting there thinking, dude, I'm surprised she's still with you. I don't always say that. But it's like, you're so chaotic, who would want to be with you? Who would want to have sex with you? You know, The first step is knowing who you are. All right? Once, once you begin to work with who you are, and I would even say this, that oftentimes when a couple comes into my office, um, and I, and I sense that either the wife or the husband is so chaotic and highly blamey and critical, I have to make an assessment whether, of whether or not they're even ready for marriage counseling. And oftentimes I'll say, I can't help you as a couple. You're not ready to be in here because you're going to pay me to sit here and argue and blame each other. And I really don't have time for that, and you don't have enough money for that. And so I won't see them as a couple. And what my objective is to do is to invite them to see me individually, uh, at least one of them, maybe the other one see uh, another counselor, see Carla, um, and to get much more anchored in who they are who you are, be much more aware of who you are, get rid of the anger, get rid of all the bitterness, get rid of all the uh, blame and criticism, and then let's come back to the table, and now we've got something to work with. Because what happens is all of that craziness going on inside of you gets projected onto the other couple or, or the other spouse. And marriage counseling doesn't work that way. The only way, by the way, here's a little secret, the only way that marriage counseling works, only way, is when each partner is willing to accept responsibility for their behavior. It's as simple as that. It won't work when the finger is being pointed across, across the, the room. It doesn't work. So, you know, I don't let that out of this room. That could really kill my practice. But this idea <coughs> then of cleaving is so important. Cleaving, this idea of being one. And that's what Genesis 2.24 invites us to be. Is first of all, I want to see, I want to see, I want to see the glory of God in my bride. And what's so negative is that I don't see. I don't see. You know, um, I have never met an ugly girl who feels cared for. I think that's impossible. Um, there are all kinds of ugly girls out there, as there are ugly men out there. But there's just something the way that God has created a female that when she feels cared for, she ain't ugly. There's a, there, there is a beautiful um, video, and if I'd have thought about it, Jeff, early, I'd have had you uh, put it up there, was Tim McGraw invites this little girl up on stage. You, you've seen that. Uh, it's been being passed around. And she is a sweetheart, and she can't believe, and I actually heard her interviewed uh, this past week on the news, and she can't believe that Tim McGraw chose her to come up on stage, and he sings this new love song to her. And she is the 
most darling thing, a sweetheart, because Tim McGraw cared about her. Do you see the glory of God in that woman that you're married to? And the positive side, again, of caring truly is sexual joy. But what oftentimes will replace sexual joy is this idea of shame and despair is that the reason you don't get lucky as often as you would like to may be because you despise your wife and she feels that. Now, you would never say that to her, but she feels your rejection. She feels somehow you don't find her attractive. You don't see the beauty of God, the glory of God in her, and she picks up on that. The idea of cleaving, again, is intended to be intimacy. And intimacy, by definition, is needs being met. And when needs get met, there is intimacy in a relationship. What's your wife's greatest needs? By the way, the way you define needs is anything that God says that he gives us. God says, I love you, must mean I need love. God says, I forgive you, must mean I need forgiveness. God says, I care about you, must mean that I need care. So anything that God says he does is what I need. And so does your wife feel a sense of care from you because you're meeting her needs? so sad that is in contrast to intimacy is there is a sense of fleeing or what we would call it is escape. There's all kinds of ways that you flee your wife or escape from your wife, working too hard, your own addiction issues, um, avoidance, uh, denial, it's fleeing. And then and then there's hiding the secrets that you keep. There's not transparency. There's not vulnerability. And then rather than intimacy, there is blame. That you blame her for where you guys are in your relationship. But in order to become one flesh, again, working off this, it always starts with expressed desire. What is it that you want? You know, again, I'm inviting you, God invites us in this act of cleaving to express desire in a non way. I mean, to say, well, you need to express desire and then for you to do it in a critical way. I want you to lose 30 pounds, clean up this house, and have dinner ready tomorrow night. That's what I want. No, that's not what we're talking about, okay? Yeah, that'll get you in my office, right, Joe? The idea is expressing desire in what you want at the deepest level. I want to be one with you. What can we do together? Because the opposite of that, the negative side, is just demands. Yeah, I'm expressing my desire, but it really becomes demanding. I recently uh, had a husband in, in my office and uh, as I often do, I have five questions that I've used through the years. Some of you guys have used this worksheet. And it just asks five questions. I've shared them here. You know, what's it like uh, to be my um, husband? What's your, uh, what's your greatest hurt uh, in being my wife? Um, three others. I asked him uh, to do this worksheet. I said, now, I want you to ask your wife these five questions. And I don't want you to comment on them. I just want you to take notes. So he came back, had the sheet, and it was full of ink. The primary thing that his wife said about him, said, I 
always feel judged by you. I never feel like uh, that I do enough. And I asked him, I said, well, so what do you think about that? He said, well, it's not true. <laughs> oh, we got a good one here. We got a winner. We got one in the boat. Uh, it's like, it's not true. I said, dude, you missed the whole point. I said, whether you think it's true or not, the point is she thinks it's true. And if she thinks it's true, it are true. It are true. So, you know, we're, we worked with that for a while, a long while. Don't ask the question if you don't want to hear the answer. Because what's so often the case in terms of these demands um, on a negative side is your own arrogance. It's arrogant to ask a question of what do you think, and then the answer comes out, with something you don't agree with, and then you say it's not true. That's that's hilarious in a very, very sad way. I want to show you a video clip from John Nash, uh, Beautiful Mind. And I would ask you to watch this. And if you were given the award for Husband of the Year, which you're not going to be, but if you were, what would your acceptance speech be? Now, in this clip, he's not being given Husband of the Year award. He's actually been being presented with the Nobel Prize. And this is his acceptance speech. And, you know, as you follow the life of John Nash, he's certainly not a model of care. But in this speech, he gets it right. What would you say if you were in his shoes? Watch this. I've always believed in numbers, in the equations and logics that lead to reason. But after a lifetime of such pursuits, I ask, what truly is logic? Who decides reason? My quest has taken me through the physical, the metaphysical, the delusional, and back. And I have made the most important discovery of my career. The most important discovery of my life. It is only in the mysterious equations of love that any logical reasons can be found. I'm only here tonight because of you. You are the reason I am. <laughs> you are all my reasons. Coffee card. Yeah. 
say what would you say what is your life about your work your accomplishments or those that you love and that love you would you turn over to Ezekiel chapter 16 that's the clean part of your Bible Probably hadn't been in Ezekiel in a while. Ezekiel chapter 16. God is not um, silent or not inhibited uh, in his use of sexual language to talk about our relationship with him. Uh, I mean, I could take you through Old Testament passages that would make you blush. Uh, of just the rawness um, of how God expresses his passion and love for you and me through sexual metaphors. And when we think about our wives and the care that we give to them, it is intended by God to be a picture of his care for us. Does God care? For you, well, yeah, did you see that man and how he loved his wife? That's how God cares for you. But what you and I have done so often on a regular basis that we need to repent daily of and confess is what Ezekiel talks about in Ezekiel 16. Listen to this. It's very raw. It's sexual in nature. And it's very convicting. Verse 8, Ezekiel 16. I came by again and saw you, saw that you were ready for love and a lover. I took care of you. I dressed you and protected you. I, I promised you my love and entered the covenant of marriage with you. I, God the Master, gave my word. You became mine. I gave you a good bath, washing off all that old blood, and anointed you with aromatic oils. I dressed you in a colorful gown and put leather sandals on your feet. I gave you linen blouses and fashionable wardrobe of expensive clothing. I adorned you with jewelry. I placed bracelets on your wrists, fitted you out with a necklace, emerald rings, sapphire earrings, and a diamond tiara. You were provided with everything precious and beautiful, with exquisite clothes and elegant food, garnished with honey and oil. You were absolutely stunning. You were a queen. You became world famous, a legendary beauty brought to perfection by my adornments. Decree of God the Master. But your beauty went to your head, and you became a common whore, grabbing anyone coming down the street and taking him into your bed. You took your fine dresses and made tents of them, using 
as brothels in which you practiced your trade. This kind of thing should never happen, never. Gentlemen, what he's saying there is you don't care. You have given yourself to less than adequate lovers. You have prostituted yourself and given your heart that was intended only for God himself. Do you care? The first step of beginning to really care for your wife is to care enough about your relationship with your real lover, the holy God of the universe, and bow your knee to him and be aware of him, be loved by him so that you might give love. It always starts with receiving first, not performance. Re-entering innocence is what we call cleaving, coming back to innocence, being like a little child. I need help. And it's this idea of connecting with God in this sensual, sexual, tender way that brings us into a state of really knowing ourselves and knowing our partner. I want you to turn over to James chapter 4. And in the shadow of that Ezekiel passage, I want you to listen and evaluate just how much you really do care for the one that God has gifted you with. A good wife is hard to find. Listen to James chapter 4 and take this as a passage written to husbands and husbands only, to men who are to care for the beauty of a woman. James chapter 4 verse 4 says this, You're cheating! On God. If all you want is your own way, flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up with enemies of God in his way. And do you suppose God doesn't care? The proverb has it that he's a fiercely jealous lover. And what he gives in love is far better than anything else you'll find. It's common knowledge that God goes against the willful proud. God gives grace to the willing humble. Now let me say this before I read the last couple of verses. There's not a man in here that's that's in, in, in this room that's hearing my voice, and none of us are without guilt that we've not loved our wives the way God intended them to. That's a fact. So my intent is not to make you feel guilty this morning. My intent is to awaken your heart to what it really does mean to care and simply acknowledge how you have been uncaring, own that, accept responsibility for that, and that may be the most caring, loving thing that you could say to your wife today or or very soon after this meeting is to go home and say, you know, sweetheart, I am so sorry. I have just not loved you well. I have failed in my caring of you. And it takes a pretty hard-hearted, bitter woman to not receive that. Listen to these last couple of verses. Verse 7. So let God work his will in you. Yell a loud no to the devil and watch him scamper. Say a quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin purify your inner life. Again, I want you to hear that is what we talked about the very first few minutes of our time together this morning. Know yourself. Purify your own life. Quit blaming her. Purify your inner life. Get your heart right. She'll follow you home. She might even crawl in your lap. Quit playing the field. Hit bottom and cry your eyes out. The fun and games are over. Get serious, really serious. 
get down on your knees before the master is the only way you'll get on your feet. When was the last time you got down on your knees for anything other than to pick up something you dropped? Get down on your knees and simply say, God, I really want to care for my wife. I want to die expressing to her how much I care. You know, one of the words that I, that I want to do a whole series on that is so troublesome to me is contempt. Contempt would go on this negative side and oftentimes replaces so much of that which God wants us to express to another person, especially our wives, through humility and grace. But rather than humility and grace, we feel a contempt toward our wife. You know what contempt means? Contempt means that I see her as worthless, that I disdain her, I despise her, I disrespect her, I disapprove of her. She's beneath me. I'm better than her. I deserve better. Really? Really? God cares about you in the way that you receive his care is to bow the knee and realize that you don't deserve any of it. And your wife doesn't have to earn your love, shouldn't have to earn your love. You care about her. She's a gift from God. Every man cares about something. The intent is to care about somebody other than yourself. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much uh, for loving us, for uh, initiating love and tenderness and grace toward us in a way that arouses us uh, to a connection with you that you have intended all through our lives. May we be awakened to your love for us in a way that inspires us to love those that you've put in our path. Thank you for our time this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a good week, guys.